Then Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Join us for the month of September as John Strand preaches his four-part series, Jesus Frees Us. As Mr. Rogers would say, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. <laughs> it's good to be here with you today, worshiping and celebrating. And today ends the, uh, the fourth of a four-part series. And this scripture has been instructive in my life for the last five years. I've been looking at this small portion of scripture, that, and it really feeds into what Jesus has for us and interprets the rest of the scripture as well. And there's depths that are meant to be plumbed, that, that free us, that free us from our burdens, that free us to serve him, that free us to learn about Jesus Christ, and today at freedom to rest, rest. He gives us rest. I remember when um, Jeremy and Eileen came to visit us down in Hamilton some two years ago, and this is my best memory of Jeremy, and um, I cooked him some hamburgers on the barbecue, and I laid them out on the table, and there they were waiting for this beautiful hamburger. And I took a bite, and I realized that in the middle, it was still red. I said, oh, no. And so Jeremy took a bite, and he looked at it, and he saw it. I said, oh, no. He sees the red. He's not going to enjoy this. And he said, John, I don't know how you did it, but this is my favorite way to eat a hamburger. <laughs> so thank God for that, that he was okay with it. Then sometime later in the day, he said, John, can we go for a walk? And I said, yes. Yes, we can, because at the church that we uh, attend in Hamilton, we have a prayer walk. And so we went over there and spent about an hour or so praying and walking and talking and sharing. And it was such an incredible, peaceful day that we were able to share our lives and pray for each other. And that's a beautiful memory I have of Jeremy, which will stay with me the rest of my life. Let's pray together as we look into the Word. Thank you, Lord, for Jeremy's life and uh, what he's done in our hearts and in this church and in the world and in the, in the community of Sudbury. And we ask, Lord, that you would preserve his legacy and that we'd go on in his name, not only in his name, but more importantly, in your name, Lord. He was a vessel you chose to bring this church to pass, and we are part of that miracle of All Nations Church. And we will Say, here I am, Lord, to go further, to go on. And ask that you just bless this word, fill our hearts with your love. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord has said to us in this scripture, I will give you rest. That means inner peace, tranquility, a sense of his beautiful spirit living inside us, giving us that peace. Jesus calls us to himself, to a transformative peace and rest that will shine like a light to the world around us. If we have peace and rest in our soul, then people will say, how can you be so peaceful in the midst of all these issues that are happening in our world and in my life especially? But Jesus calls us to be a light, to shine forth to the world around us, to show a different way of life, a different way of living in peace. In peace I lay down. John Wesley was crossing the Atlantic, the great hymn writer, and there came upon a big storm, and the, and the, and the storm was going to sweep the, the boat into oblivion, and everybody was terrified and petrified. A big storm, the waves were breaking over, and the, and the, and the boat was in peril. But there was a group of Christians who were praying and praising in the middle of the storm. And John Wesley said to himself, how can this be? Because he was terrified for his very life. But these Christians were praying and praising God in the midst of the storm. And that's when he began to see, like, I need that peace. I need that rest. I need to be able to face my life with peace and rest. And we need the same, to face our life with peace and rest. Hebrews 4 and 9 says, There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works just as God did from his. We're called to rest. We're called to rest in him. This is so very important. This is the beginning of our Christian life, to rest unburdened 
in his presence, to rest unburdened in the life and the love of Jesus Christ. Well, why don't we rest? We probably all know, but I'm going to identify it for you anyway. This is basically out of my life and history. After looking back on my life, I see that I don't rest. I didn't rest. I didn't rest in all my different efforts to live my life in Christ. Because first of all, the reason I didn't get the proper rest in the Lord was because I allowed my work to define me. I worked in carpentry, and I thought, well, if I can build a beautiful house, then that'll define me. People can say, look, look at the house John built. And I, I took people around, look at this is what I built. See that big house? I did that. I allowed my work to define me, but I, I realized in Christ that I'm more than my work. I enjoy working. I like to build stuff with my hands. But I'm more than that. We are more than our work. Our definition doesn't just come from our work. We can do more than that. We can do more. And so we allow our possessions to define us as well. What we have, and I had a lot of carpenter tools, I still do, and I couldn't let go of them. The wife says, you got to get rid of some of those tools, John. Some of them probably don't work. I said, well, yeah, but I can probably rebuild those and, and get them to work again, you know? She said, no, it's enough. Get rid of it. Okay. You have to listen to your wife. <laughs> so I had to stop going to Home Depot and getting a new drill, a new uh, saw, and that's it. No more. I'm not defined by the stuff I have, even though it's nice to have stuff. But that's not our definition. We're not defined by our possessions. We, don't, we are more than that. We are more than our, the sum total of what we have. And sometimes we allow our desires to define us, the things that we want, the things that we got to have. As we look out into the world, we, we think, well, look, I'd like that. I've been um, riding my bike in the Muskokas as I come up here to, to join with you. I stop off and ride my bike. And last Sunday, I went home, and I was riding my bike through the Muskokas. And I saw these incredible cottages worth a million dollars or more. And I thought, you know, I want that. I want that. I want to be able to sit up on, that, on, on the uh, veranda there, on the deck, and look over the waters. And man, if I could have that, then I'd be really happy. I was really, wa I said, man, I, I deserve it. <laughs> I don't know what happens. But then I said afterwards, well, I guess probably I'm not really needing that. Sometimes our desires, they want to define us. They want to get to us. And sometimes we get in trouble because we desire things that we don't need or we shouldn't have. But we lose our peace and lose our rest because we want stuff. We, our desires overwhelm us. And we know that that gets us in trouble. And also, we allow our relationships to define us. If only I could hang out with Mick Jagger. <laughs> you know? That would, I'd say, look, I know Mick Jagger. I hung out with him. Do you see me on stage? I'm cool, right? Peace, baby. I'm cool. I'm there. Mick Jagger. He knows me. That's why he's important, because he knows me, right? <laughs> so, we want to hang out with the best kind of people. And that helps to define us. But no, we're more than our relationships, because you know, by experience, by this time in our lives, we know that our relationships can get us in trouble. I talked to a young man in uh, Hamilton before coming up here, and he says, you know, I love my girlfriend so much, I'm concerned that she's going to take the place of God in my life. Good luck with that. <laughs> but you know what? It's our relationships that get us in trouble. So why don't we rest? Because we allow these things to define us. And yes, they're all good. We need that. But more than that, we need Jesus Christ. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Jesus gives us rest, gives us ultimate rest and peace. In that intimate relationship, we are at spiritual rest. You know, my father-in-law, Bert McGee, was somebody I idolized in many respects because he was a beautiful man of God, and uh, he just did everything right. In the morning, he would eat his porridge, and read his scripture at the same time. I thought, man, if only I could do that. But uh, towards the end of his life, he developed Parkinson's and, and he eventually passed away. And on one trip to the doctor, I said, Bert, how do you feel? How do you feel? And he, was, and he wasn't doing well physically. 
And he said to me, John, I feel loved. Isn't that beautiful? At the end of his life, he felt loved. He felt the love of Jesus Christ welling up in his heart, and he felt loved. And I believe that at the end of our life, that's what's important if we feel loved by the Lord Jesus Christ. That gives us peace in whatever circumstance that we find ourselves in. It's the love of the Lord Jesus Christ welling up inside us. That defines us, and that gives us rest. That gives us the rest that we're looking for. Jesus invites us to be defined by his love for us. The bedrock of love is what inspires our Christian life, and it starts there. It starts there. It's got to start there. For if we have not love, we're like clanging singles, symbols. Isn't it true? Love is what defines us. It's a bedrock of our existence in Christ to feel that love and to share that love and to give that love and to be found and just washed in the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. The depths, the heights, the widths of that love. But then how do we rest? How do we indeed rest? St. Augustine said, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in God. Bastille, uh, uh, somebody, uh, a band that's to contemporary today, said, there's a hole in my heart, I can't fill it. There's a hole in my heart, the song goes. Can you fill it, reaching out? Fill this hole, and we know. We hear from the words of Jesus Christ, only he can fill it, only he can give you rest, only he can give you peace. We can't find it in this world. We can gain the entire world and lose our soul because we have not love. How do we rest? By receiving the beautiful gifts from the heart of God. And I've talked about gifts before that Jesus has for us, that God has for us. And it's important to understand that salvation is a gift. Everything we have from God is a gift to receive. We all want to work our way to God, in a sense. We all want to work and see what I've done. This is my work. This is how I... This is how I can show my Christianity because I've done all this work. It starts in the heart of Jesus Christ. It starts there. We need to receive. We need to receive. And this is what we're doing here today, receiving from the Lord Jesus Christ, not from me. I've got nothing to offer except the Lord Jesus Christ. Receive the Lord today. Receive him. So first, my first point is, how do we receive? How do we get to be at rest? How do we get peace in our lives? How do we settle down and just relax with our Christianity, with our Lord, by first of all receiving Jesus Christ? Receive Jesus Christ. And we, I know we've heard this before, but for me it's a new thing. To receive Jesus Christ is to receive him in totality, all of him, all of him. To drink him in, to say, Lord, this is all I need. You are all I need. And Gene and I were talking on the way to church and we said that, you know, by the time we're 65 and above, you finally begin to realize what life is all about. And the words that we have so commonly used in our Christian experience now become much more powerful when you're older. When you look back into your life and you see what the Lord has done. You see how the Lord has moved and brought beautiful people into our lives and brought a church like this into life. Birthed by the love of Jesus Christ. Birthed by people with love in their hearts, like Jeremy, burning with love wanting to reach out into the community. First of all, receive Jesus Christ himself. And freely he gave himself. And he says, come to me. Let me gather you to my heart. Receive him today. What's he saying if we could hear him? If he could be here instead of me, we'd rather have that. I'd rather have that. He would say, hey, come to me. Hey, I know you, I know who you are, I know your burdens, I know your sins, I know everything about you. In fact, I was there when you were made. I was there when you were birthed in the innermost parts of the earth. I was there with you, I was there with your mother. I know you, I know who you are. He's saying, come here, come to me. Come to me, I will give you rest. That's what he's saying. Take a break, hang out with me, I will show you how to live your life in such a way that you're free and unburdened, you're able to Worship freely. You're able to feel that love that I have for you. Receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Receive his love in your hearts. And you know, as you get closer to the Lord Jesus Christ, you hear him more clearly, right? As you get closer, as we get older, I can't quite hear what you're saying. Well, come a little closer. Come a little closer. So I can hear what you're saying. And when you come closer to Jesus, he comes closer to you. That's a promise from the scripture. As you open your heart and receive him, 
he comes closer to you and you're able to, you're able to hear him much clearer. So what is Jesus saying? He said it from the cross, he said, it is finished. The work of redemption is done. He's saying, look, it's finished. I did all the work, all the work is done. You don't have to work at it anymore. You don't have to please God because I died for you on the cross and carried your burdens all the way to heaven's gates and laid them down at the Father's side. And he says, it is finished, it's done. It's done. The work of the Lord Jesus Christ is done and we're called to receive that. You don't have to strive and strain to please God anymore. You don't have to walk up the steps, 500 to 1,000 steps on your knees to atone for your sins because Jesus Christ has done it all, everything. It's, it is finished as you get close to the Lord Jesus Christ and your burdens are being lifted. You hear his words. It is finished, all the work is done. I've done all the work for you. It's like this um, foreman worked for a construction company all of his life. I like talking about construction, that's what I know. I worked in construction, <laughs> still do. If you feel my hands, they're still full of calluses. So anyway, I got to know this guy in construction and um, he had worked all of his life for this company. And I said, look, you got nothing. You've worked all your life for these people and you've got nothing. So when he turned 65, he had nothing. He had nothing, he had no money, he, didn't have, he couldn't retire, he said, I gotta keep working. So that day, the boss said, come and look at this house we just built. And the foreman said, well, how could you build this house without me knowing about it? I should have been involved with this. He said, don't worry about that, just come and check out this house. So they opened the door and went in, and the foreman who had worked all of his life for this company, looked it all over and said, this is beautiful, who's this house for? Who is this house for? And he was a little bit ticked because he hadn't had his hand in it. He should have been working on himself. So the, um, the boss pulls out the keys and said, this house is for you. Amen. Thank you for your years of hard work and service. And this is a free gift. This is for you. And the guy was, inc it was incredible because not only did he get a brand new house paid for, he got a fridge full of food and he also got money to live on. And you see, he was handed the keys to the house. And he was able to rest and be at peace for his retirement. And this is what Christ has done for us. He built the house of faith. He built our salvation. And he's handing the keys to heaven to us. He's handing us the keys. It's a free gift. It is finished. It's done. Enter in. Receive the free gift of Jesus Christ. He whispers into our hearts, it is finished. It's done, receive my gift. It's a gift. It's a beautiful gift from God. Receive it, drink it in, believe it, understand it. He whispers in our hearts, he shouts it from the hilltop. Receive the gift of God. Receive Jesus Christ. And every day we're called to receive him. Receive the Lord Jesus Christ. If you haven't received the Lord, then maybe today is a good time to receive him into your heart. It's a free gift. It's not a weird thing. It's a beautiful thing. It's not a crazy religious thing. It's something that warms us. As we receive Jesus Christ, he comes in and we feel more complete. We feel like now we're one. We have rest and we have peace because of Jesus Christ. Well, how do we rest? You know, Jesus Christ changes us. You know something else that we're called to receive? The implanted word. James 1 and 21 says, Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that's so prevalent and humbly accept the word that's planted in you which can save you. Humbly accept the word, the Bible that's been given to us. Humbly accept the word which is able to change you and save you. You know, as we read the word, we get to know Jesus. All the things that he did, he healed, he touched, he, he, he did such amazing things, spoke a word of encouragement. And he said, I've not come to condemn you, I've not come to judge you. I've come to give you life. This is his mission. This is our mission. We have come to give life to our family, to our wife, to our husband, to our children, to lift them up and, and unburden them. You know, my wife was very good with our children. We have two boys, Leif and Lars, good Scandinavian names. Should have been Bob and Bill, right? I know, I know. But they're Leif and Lars, beautiful boys, and born in a miraculous way. They shouldn't have been born, but we prayed and prayed, and the Lord gave us two boys, two gifts from God. Two beautiful gifts. 
And they've grow, they grew up and they've, they fought. They used to fight and wrestle, you know, a little bit of that, and that's good. Of course, I was in there too. I was doing a little bit of that. <laughs> Come on, I'll get you. But Alana stepped in with her wisdom, and he said to the boys, she said to the boys, we are not a fighting and arguing family. We're a loving and we're a hugging family. And she always repeated that. And we're here to love each other. Beautiful words of encouragement to our children. And they grew up in that. And today they love each other and they spend time with each other because Alana spoke the word of love, the word of, of truth into their hearts. And they, they grew in that, received the implanted word. When I was going to Bible college, uh, I was very shy and I was with a group of Christians and they're all like crazy Christians. They're, they're sharing, they're Pentecostal charismatics. They're sharing and praising and, and, and speaking out loud. And it was just like a crazy atmosphere. And I was shy. I couldn't deal with it. I said, Lord, I got to get out of here. These people are Christians and I'm not like them. I'm not like these Christians. And I thought maybe there's something wrong with me. So I began to read the scriptures. I was drawn to the scripture. This is my only hope. Lord, help me to to cope with this. And so I went to the scripture and I, I, I wrote down these scriptures about love. Only the ones about love, because I felt unloved, I felt unwelcome. People would look at me and say, where are you from, Canada, eh? Okay. <laughs> I was down in the States. And um, so I began to look at the scriptures concerning love, the love of God. Just a few simple scriptures. I wrote them on cards, I had them in my pockets, I wrote them on the wall, a few simple scriptures about love. And you know what, it changed me, it changed me. It began to work in me. You know, we don't need a whole lot of scripture to change us, we just need those that maybe apply to our situation. We need the whole Bible, but sometimes we need a particular scripture that will work in our hearts. And this worked in my heart. And this began to change me. And I began to take part in the Bible college. I began to yell and shout and do all these things because the Lord was freeing me by the implanted word in my heart. It has a power to change you. It has a power to change you. Look at me, I'm changed. Not by my own efforts, but by, by the word of God and by the, by the Lord himself has changed me. Because if you'd have looked at me years ago, you would have said, what's wrong with John? He's so shy. And he, the people would say to me, you're your own worst enemy. I said, whoa, my God, I'm so, such a mess. I'm such a mess. But the Lord, by his word, by his presence in my life, has made me into a glorious mess. <laughs> I love myself, despite the warts. Before it was too much. Look at what I, look. But now, with the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, he's changing me by the word. My wife had cancer some 17 years ago. Today she's free of cancer. Amen. Amen. But um, during the time she had the cancer, it was a very difficult time. Very, very difficult because, wow, that's such a bomb blew up in our family and everybody was, you know, we we're just like totally messed up because she was so young and she developed cancer. But she had the operation that uh, took the cancer out and then she had to go through 26 weeks of radiation. And um, she said to me, how am I gonna get through this, John? How am I gonna survive this? This is terrible. This is terrible. Radiation, you know, like you get radiated with this laser beam. And, and I said, well, just think of a scripture that could help you in this situation. And she found Proverbs 18.10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. And every time she got on that steel table when the radiation was about to be delivered, she rehearsed the scripture, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. And she imagined herself inside a strong tower on that radiation table. She imagined herself in a strong tower given to her by the Lord, protected by the Lord and secure in the strong tower of the Lord. And the Lord himself was standing guard over her for 26 sessions. And this is how she got through by the word of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us through that as a family. And as a family of God, we'll get through 
Whatever is going on, we'll get through to Jesus Christ. He'll help us. He'll deliver us. He'll lead us on. So finally, how do we rest in God? By receiving Jesus Christ, receiving Jesus, the precious Son of God, loving us, caring for us, lifting our burdens. He didn't come to condemn you, but lift your burdens. And he, by receiving the implanted word, which is able to save your souls, able to change you and give you joy. The word of God is so precious. And it cuts down deep and changes our hearts and brings healing into our lives. And we know that at the bottom of our life, it's love that's informing us. The love of Jesus Christ that's informing us. We're defined by his love. That's what defines us. His love. That's what gives us rest and peace. His love. And it's not just an emotion. It's a reality. If we look on the cross, we see that it's a reality. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That we would not perish, but have eternal life. Whosoever accepts, receives the Lord Jesus Christ will have eternal life. To receive him is to receive life. It's not just an emotion, but it is an emotional experience. But it's also fixed on eternity. The cross is fixed on eternity. It can never be taken down. It's up there for good. Worship the Lord. And finally, by receiving our transformation, you see that if we receive Jesus Christ, deep in our hearts where we live, receive him. And if we receive the implanted word, the final step is to receive your transformation, to be transformed. You know, sometimes we get to a point in our life where we say, this is it. We've kind of come to maturity. We've done all we want to do. We've learned everything we want to do. And we're just sitting there. We've kind of come to the top of our experience. You know, you can't change Sam because, you know, he just so stubborn, whatever. You know, I can't change John. I look at myself. It's hard to change someone like me. My wife said to me, we got, I got married at 30. She said, John, you're just a stubborn old bachelor, aren't you? I said, well, nobody's ever said that to me before. He, but I said, well, I'll try to change. I'll try not to be so cheap. <laughs> just a cheapskate, I was. And she said, you know, you really shouldn't be hanging on to your money. But I didn't have any money anyway. But I was trying to hang on to the money. I said, no, I let it go. Alana helped me to let go. And the Lord has blessed me because I didn't focus on money. I did not receive our transformation. We be changed. 2 Corinthians 3 and 18 says, And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with an ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. We're changed because we worship the Lord. We give him freely our lives. We worship him and we're changed. We contemplate his beauty. And he is beautiful. We can't tear that down. And media tries to tear the image of Christ down by saying, you know, that religion is just a bunch of bunk. And Jesus, you know, I don't know if he ever really existed. And, and the things he did, that's impossible. But I'm standing here today to tell you that it's not a bunch of bunk. It's real and true. It happened in my life. And I know it's happened in yours. He's real. And I feel him deep down in my soul. Amen. I feel him working in me, changing me, transforming me. And he can change your life too. If he can change me, he can change anybody. Amen. Am I right? Amen. Be still and know that I'm God. Well, I want to finish. You know that um, these, this type of information, the Lord said in preceding scriptures, it's only given to the childlike. This type of information which I'm giving to you is something that Jesus and the Father is allowing you to hear. And he said in a preceding scripture, this is not given to the wise and learned, but it's given to the childlike in, in nature. To receive it like a child, to say, yes, this is true. I need this kind of stuff. This is what's going to help me, what's going to save me, what's going to bring me to heaven. But the wise and learned, they say, no, well, I do, you know, it's not true. But it is true. The Lord speaks to us, heart, our hearts this morning and asks us to be childlike and to accept. And you remember I started out with Mr. Rogers? I'm going to finish with Mr. Rogers. Because he spoke to children, didn't he? he had a, did you ever watch Mr. Rogers? I did. I thought, you know, this is very childish. It's for kids. But I still watched it as an adult. But I got older. I, okay, Mr. Rogers. Yeah. He was a minister. And his ministry was to children. And he talked about a, like a childlike experience of faith. And this, I'm going to finish with this. 
Mr. Rogers. And Jesus said, you've hidden this kind of information from the wise and the learned and revealed them to the childlike. So open your hearts to receive what Mr. Rogers would say. And uh, I believe to my heart, it's also the words of our Heavenly Father. It's you I like. It's not the things you wear. It's not the way you do your hair. But it's you I like. The way you are right now. The way deep down inside you. Not the things that hide you. Not your toys. They're just beside you. It's you I like. Every part of you. Your skin, your eyes, your feelings, whether old or new. I hope that you'll remember, even when you're feeling blue, that it's you I like. It's you yourself. It's you. It's you I like. Childlike words to the hearts. We're all children inside, aren't we? We pretend to be so sophisticated and, and wise and, and, and all that, but we're not. We're childlike in our hearts. Receive this four-part series, receive this word from Jesus Christ into your heart. Open your hearts. This will begin to bear fruit as you focus on it day by day, as you give your burdens every day to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's close in prayer this session, this part of our service, and focus on the beautiful words and the beautiful person and the freedom we have in Jesus Christ. We're defined by his love for us. This is what defines us, nothing else. Nothing else. And we grow in that in our the foundation of our faith is built and it grows in that beautiful love. Without that, we have nothing. We're like a clanging cymbal. Come to Jesus Christ. Be in his presence. Like John, the beloved disciples, as they had the Last Supper, John was leaning on, his, leaning on Jesus. And they're very close. And I always think of myself, I'm that beloved disciple. I'm close to Jesus. And you are as well as you get close to Jesus. He will speak to you. Beautiful words from his heart.